Um, hello and welcome to everyone joining us for this conversation this evening. Um, my name is Fiona Shields and I'm Head of Photography at The Guardian. Um, I'm also a nominator for the Pre Picte Photo Prize and um, uh, recently I was the guest editor of the book Collage, which is a fantastic celebration of the Pre Picte's women nominees. Um, tonight I'd like to introduce you to two of these award-winning photographers, both of whom, it's no coincidence, are featured in the book. Uh, firstly, Mandy Barker, whose powerful work around the issue of marine plastics has received global recognition. She's fe been featured in the likes of National Geographic, Time Magazine and The Guardian, and exhibited around the world from MoMA in New York to the V&A in London. And I can guarantee that if you spend any time with Mandy's work, you will think completely differently about our relationship with plastics. Um, I'd also like to introduce Alice Mann, uh, who also internationally recognised, published by The New Yorker, New York Times Magazine, and I'm proud to say The Guardian too. Um, Alice was also a winner of the prestigious Taylor Wessing Portrait Prize, which uh, exhibited at the National Portrait Gallery for her series Drummies, um, which is a study of the female drum majorette teams in South Africa. And it's a really beautiful series of work and incredibly uplifting. Welcome to you both. And just before we begin our conversation, I wanted to say to everybody who's joined us this evening that if you would like to post questions, there is a there's a, a Q and A um, opportunity here on the webinar. Um, and so once we've kind of you know rounded off our chat, do feel free uh, post your questions and um, and we'll uh, I'll put them to our photographers this evening. So first of all, I wanted to ask you, um, Mandy, what are the challenges and sort of opportunities, for example, or uh, um, advantages that you feel working as a, a woman in photography brings? Um, the advantages are um, sort of being in a, but for me, you know, I'm in a, I, I cross boundaries between science and expeditions and all that type of thing, which can be generally male dominated um, environments, um, especially the science world still is, um, you know, underrepresented by female scientists. Um, so to be able to work with those sort of people and get into those sort of environments um, can be an advantage um, because I feel I can bring a different approach, um, a different narrative to say the plastic issue um, and the kind of activists that have gone before me. Um, in a more sort of subtle um, activism way, in a in a want of saying. And and how did you how did you make your way into the world of photography, which you know as as we all acknowledge is traditionally a sort of male oriented domain? What was it that made you think when you were you know a little girl, for example, what that you know that's what I'd like to do? Well, I was first, the first image I think I ever saw was by Don McCullen. Um, you know, his the picture of his sort of soldier um, on the front of a book. Um, I went on to do an art foundation course and went to do a career in graphic design. Um, I actually worked in London and I was two streets away from the photographer's gallery, luckily, um, mm -hmm. when it was in Covent Garden. And in my lunchtime, I used to go around to the photographer's gallery and I used to sit and kind of, you know, look at the exhibitions. And at that time, you could take your lunch in there and read the magazines and look at the books. And I think um, that's mainly where I first became engaged with female photography, because it's something that I never really um, was sort of fed um, as I was growing up and you didn't have any inspirations from family members or or anything like that no I didn't really come from an artistic um home life um the first female exhibition I ever saw was um Circa Cottingham um at the side gallery in Newcastle where I was doing my graphic design course there um and I regularly began visiting the side gallery so I kind of knew that photography was somewhere within me because I was just drawn to the photography galleries everywhere I went uh, and was kind of more interested in in that than the work I was actually doing. Um, funnily enough, when I was working in London, I was actually commissioning photography um, in the um, sort of late 80s, 90s. And it was predominantly male photographers that we were commissioning because there really weren't any female photographers um, in that role. So at that same time, um, you know, it made me think about the fact that there weren't many female photographers and what, what that means and mm. you know, um, sowed a seed in my mind, I guess. 
I mean, do you think there's a part of you that thought, well, wh why not me? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, I think the fact that I was drawn to the photographer's gallery, you know, several times a week and was looking at their work on the wall um, and learning about new female artists that way um, definitely made me think there's a possibility that I could try and um, kind of become a photographer and see where that would take me. Um, and this is where I sort of was very inspired by the work of Sally Mann in the early 90s. Um, you know, it was her work that I think really struck a chord with me because I'd never seen that type of work before. Um, and this was something that, you know, sort of made me think about how you could differently represent um, the portrait, for instance. Mm, I think that I think that's true that, you know, a lot of the women's work that we see comes with a, a sort of particularly intimate nature. Um, Alice, tell us a little bit about how how you made your way into photography, because uh, the other thing is that you're you know, you are no, known for your portraiture. So how did you find your way to where you are now? Um, so I actually, I guess I was very much, uh, was obviously wanted to do something visual. Um, I actually wanted to go into art direction. Um, my parents said I need to get a university degree. So at the time, um, you know, fine art was a, a formal university degree. So I chose that uh, with the idea of, you know, getting a university degree helps you get a job. Um, didn't necessarily make sense, to, you know, um, in their kind of argument, but I studied fine art at Michaela's in, um, at the University of Cape Town, which is their fine art school. I actually wanted to study painting, um, but then at the time when it came to choose our majors, um, I sort of realized I wasn't very good at painting and I had really good marks in photography, so it was sort of like, oh, okay, I'll do that. Um, and I think a real light bulb moment for me came when we were doing the darkroom printing and I was watching one of the master's students put together a much larger body of work he'd been doing and kind of seeing the way that a body of work was sort of put together and the narratives inherent in that. And also the kind of care and attention, you know, obviously through the darkroom printing and, you know, how much each image mattered, but in terms of a larger body kind of unlocked something inside me and I was like very very fascinated um and then by that and then within the context of obviously studying fine art and being able to uh, you know be quite critical of you know context and narrative and especially in South Africa which is such a contentious place for image making and a space that I also feel has a very very strong kind of uh, group of contemporary photographers working from South Africa. I am biased, but you know, I, I feel very proud to call myself a South African photographer, knowing the um, individuals that are kind of involved in the medium at the moment. Um, so it sort of started from there and then, you know, I decided, okay, this is what I'm gonna try and do. Um, I was, you know, I did some internships with some printers and some photographers here. And then what I uh, did the same in London and I think I really started to realize very much the challenges when I, 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 I remember I, I took an assisting job, um, you know, cause everyone was like, oh, you, 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 should, you should do assisting. Um, so I took an assisting job at a studio in order to learn more. And it was just like very basic things, like the things that you had to carry, <laughs> like the, the sort of male uh, assistants, you know, were like these massive guys. And mm, that's you know, so interesting, them. isn't it? That people think <laughs> that, you know, it's a, it's a guy's gig because of the kit that you have to handle. Like this very physical thing. Like, can you lift a bar fridge upstairs to Studio E? And I was like, well, I can't lift a bar fridge, you know, so I had to get help. And it was like always the shining um, assistants were the ones then who would go on to get hired. And I quite quickly realized, okay, I wasn't very great technically, like I was good with people, but like my technical application as well as my strength was like a massive, like it, it wasn't working in my favor. Um, so that was something I realized, like physically I wasn't the same. I didn't have that same presence and, you know, physical strength. Um, and then I think, you know, as I was trying, you know, to get work and failing for quite many number of years, I sort of very much realized also like that thing of, having to explain myself 98% of the time to men who would be 
potentially hiring me you know it was like there were very few women um and sort of not feeling understood or like I had to work so hard to explain myself and also I think being told you know you need to be more assertive you need to be stronger in what you want you know um and I think sort of second guessing myself feeling like very much imposter syndrome like what I was doing was wrong and like I had to fit into this space or this space and um you know I think the sort of imposter syndrome thing is something that many women experience in a lot of fields um so I'm like leaning into the question of what I think is actually my strength mm -hmm. I think I have come to realize that that sort of not being overly assertive not being very dominant not like filling up the space if there is space is actually a strength of mine um I think in my work I've come to realize you know because I'm very much I'm focused on people and portraiture and exploring the human condition that is what uh, I'm completely inspired by and I think when working with people being able to open up conversation but then leave space for people to kind of show what they want and fill the space and not me telling them what to do but creating a, a comfortable environment where people feel that they can do what they want, I think has actually been a strength of mine. Um, so I think it is also just realizing that, you know, that these sort of things that are seen as weaknesses, actually as a woman, you can use to your strength. Um, That's so interesting. I was gonna say to um, Mandy, and also it'd be lovely to look at some examples of both of your work. So maybe we could just play some of Mandy's uh, pictures now while I just ask you, Mandy, you, you do you identify with what Alice is saying there about perhaps you know bringing something different to uh, what would be expected perhaps of a male photographer? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, there are a lot of similarities there. You know, although I'm photographing plastic inanimate objects and Alice is photographing um, obviously portraits and people. Um, yeah, the same kind of things apply. I, I realise that, and this may be my personality. I don't know, but I've taken that kind of um backseat approach where that softly softly approach where I'm not kind of that aggressive activist that marches in there and wants to do this that and the other I kind of um stand back and take that softly sort of you know kind of feel to sort of get in there and um you know begin to talk to the scientists and find out what's going on and then kind of try and wheedle myself in there to to get the pictures that I need or, or borrow the objects that are, are necessary um, so yeah, it's a, you know, is that a female, um, you know, kind of way of working or is that my personality? I, I don't know how to separate the two, but um, anyway, it seems to work for me. Um, yeah, I know what you mean. It's probably a bit of both in, yeah. in, in you know, in reality. And and you mentioned there about, you know, um, about uh, act, activism. And I think it's probably fair to say that, you know, you as well as being a photographer, you are an activist or you, your work has led you to become an activist. And I just wondered if you could chat to us a little bit about that, about how you've evolved with this kind of um, you, to, to reach this place of sort of meaning and purpose in your work. Yes, I mean, it wasn't intentional from the beginning. Um, you know, I, I came to photography later in life and um purely because you know I came across the issue myself you know walking on my local beach I began to see sort of rubbish and plastic waste washing up um, <clears throat> at that particular time I was studying an MA in photography and I was kind of obsessed with photographing natural light portraits um, probably led on from the Sally Mann influence um, and when I sort of uh, joined the photography course the first project we got was um, right you're not going to do what you want to do you're not going to photograph how you normally photograph, you have to do something totally different. So for me, it was photographing objects, no natural light, um, you know, the total opposite of what I was doing. Uh, and somehow that worked for me because it made me try harder to make something new work. Um, I'd never photographed in studio before or using that, you know, kind of um, studio lighting or anything like that. So um, it, yeah, it made me try harder to make the project work. and. The plastic was, um, you know, the first project I did. So that the course kind of broke my kind of mold in a way. So, um, so yeah, it all led on from there. And going back to your question about activism, um, 
I began to get more and more interested in the problem. And the more research I did on the internet, which then, you know, backs up um, my photographs and my approaches with scientists, um, you know, kind of led me to kind of get on this sort of roller coaster of new things that were happening and wanting to create new series and new projects to let people know of new issues that were coming about because of the plastic problem. Because this is so interesting, because you really do bridge the world of art and photography and, and science, actually, which, you know, again, is another sort of what is often seen as a male dominated environment. Um, so, it, you know, again, it's, it's probably been quite difficult for you to, you know, to, to break into that and, and to, you know, to feel credible. It's interesting when Alice talks a little bit about imposter syndrome. I mean, I, I'm certain that none of us really ought to feel that but you know where we feel it's not a space that we're necessarily you know traditionally welcome it, it can feel a little bit uncomfortable at the beginning exactly and I mean for me it's you know starting out on this path as a female artist and approaching a male scientist um who's you know key in the plastic research um you know from their point of view they're probably thinking oh you know what you know what's she going to do and all that kind of thing so for them to, you know, gradually sort of realise what my intentions are, how serious I am, and, you know, I've got to respect that the work that they do and portray it in a, you know, the proper way, <clears throat> you know, I can't exaggerate, say, something visually just to make it visually stimulating. Um, it has to be true to the facts, uh, and I have to, you know, um, take into account that it's their work and, you know, not take advantage of, um, you know, what they're path of research is. And Alice, if we can just turn to your work for a moment. Um, I mean, uh, one of the things that you just touched on as well that has driven you, obviously, is the contentious issues around uh, photographing um, in South Africa in particular. Um, and so I wanted to, if we could just look at your work for a moment and just have a little chat about responsibility and accountability in photography, because um, I'm aware that you have made it a mission to try to break down stereotypes, which is a sort of form of activism in, in your uh, in your way as well. Um, I think very much, you know, obviously I came from the fine art background, I suppose. So I was very lucky to be exposed to, you know, a larger framework and discourse of the history of photography um, in South Africa and, you know, the way that it was used as a tool, um, I think very much to reinforce stereotypes and, uh, you know, kind of reinforce often very negative ideas about people. Um, and I think under understanding that when entering sort of into the framework of a medium is really important. And as a white photographer, um, I think there's a lot of responsibility that I have to be very aware of when creating images, especially obviously of people. Um, you know, when you have a camera, it, you, you're in the sort of position of power. And I think it's very, very important to be sensitive to that and kind of negotiate that in the interactions um, when working with people. And I think very much a way that I try to, to sort of do that is, as I mentioned before, is trying to create space uh, for people and make an environment where they feel comfortable, um, you know, where they have a sense of what I'm trying to do with the project and the concept. And we are then go forward kind of working together as an open conversation and also where they actually feel that they can tell me what they want to do in terms of the direction or, you know, what they feel comfortable with um, and kind of how they imagine themselves to be shown. Um, I also really very much like the idea that photography can be aspirational. Um, I think that sort of argument of photography as being like post-truth, I find very interesting. I don't feel photography has to tell the exact truth and I think the notion of the photographer as the subjective sort of viewpoint is really wrong so I think you know engaging with that like I'm a subjective person the people I'm working with have a very particular point of view and we can kind of like skew the way that the audience might see the images and I think that then gives gives us control and it allows you know 
people to tell me what they want and I can work with them to show that uh, that and for me that's a very important way of you know addressing that sort of um, that problematic view of photography as you know the photographer just directing mm -hmm. and seeing what they want and then rather showing something that kind of reveals the aspirations of the people who are in front of the lens <laughs> and always to me I, I feel like that's actually really the most interesting um, it's much more beautiful and poetic and you know it, it, it has so much than what I could just imagine um, and I think also very much for me that is what it is about it's not just what I see but it's like how do people see themselves and how do they want to be seen and it's like I learn when I work with people and you know I work on my projects over a very long period of time I do this because I want to do justice to the people I work with so I need everything to be really perfect and represent everything in the best of my ability and also because working over a long period of time I feel like I learn um, and it teaches me and I kind of want to reflect that to the audience you know whoever's viewing these images I want them to be able to see the care and attention that I have tried to put into this and be able to you know aptly see the dignity and the empowerment of the people in the images which uh, I think is very important <laughs> sorry so that was a mouthful yeah. no, no, no it's so it's so interesting and I think that's an incredibly honest answer <laughs> to say that you know because what you're um, alluding to is the the collaboration to create the images not just that you want to make but that the subjects that you're photographing want is how they want to be seen as well so so that you know, uh, allowing or or kind of facilitating that agency is really important to you. Um, and yeah. so I, I wanted to ask this next question about what happens to the image once it loses, once it once it's outside of your control. So, you know, once you have um, entered it to a publication or to a photo competition, for example, or, you know, as, as all work does now ends up on the Internet, um, how how does that sit with you about your kind of your, your lack of control once it's left your camera? Sorry, this is at me, right? Yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> I think this is a really good question. And I think, again, I think it um, addresses that sense of inherent responsibility that, you know, photographers have and, you know, specifically photographers who are working with people. Um, you know, obviously very much what I try and do is always you know you can never know exactly what a project is going to be especially when you're working over, uh, on it over a number of years but to have a sense of what I'm trying to do and really make sure that people understand and then are engaged in that you know because portraits are conversations and I think if people understand and can you know people need to be a part of that conversation so that's very important um, and I think always kind of showing the work as part of a project also very important um you know like trying as much as possible to not allow things to be decontextualized but you know and I, I think again this is take a lot of care and attention and and I think I, I like to think that that shows in in the larger bodies of work that I produce but also in the way that they are disseminated how are they being shown how they're being framed what kind of text is accompanying them you know I think there's a lot of other things that go with the images not just them being shown but you know like captions are really really important to me um you know I, I always need the work to be shown with captions names um always has to be shown with text as much as I can kind of try and create nuance and add to the complexity of what I'm trying to do um I think is is very important so yeah I don't know if, I hope that answers your your question. Um, yeah, yes, yeah, yes, yes. I think it does, and I just wanted to ask um, Mandy as well because Mandy, you touched on um, Sally Mann as being an inspiration, and I I, I know that you are quite um, you'd like to talk a little bit about her work, and and I thought that this idea of kind of responsibility and accountability leads quite nicely onto that because uh, some of Sally Mann's images in the past have been the subject of some controversy one again once they had left her camera and left the control of her kind of you know intimate family life and I just wondered if there was a kind of if this was a good moment perhaps to to consider those and and hear your opinions about them 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, Sally Mann has inspired me from, you know, the beginning of when I first saw her um, images, immediate family, of which we've got one here. And I was very lucky enough um, a couple of weeks ago to meet Sally and speak with her and listen to one of her talks. Um, she spoke about this series, Immediate Family, um, for the first time in 25 years. She's not spoken about this and she said she will not never speak about it again. So it was an absolute honour to be there and to hear more from her directly about um, the series because I feel kind of um, quite sad in a way that part of the legacy of this series will be linked with controversy and the fact, um, you know, that they are groundbreaking artistic in images. Um, so I just wanted to re read... Um, from her, because I don't want to put it into my own words, uh, just, just quote from what she said from the uh, talk that she gave. If we just go back to the first picture, um, this is called the candy cigarette. Uh, and she said, this was just a candy cigarette, not a metaphor for life on the streets. Jesse's vamping was not a predictor for future pathology. Virginia's back turned from the camera. It did not mean anything except a yell at Emmett. Stilts in the background were just stilts, not phallic symbols. And she said, these comments had our lives reinterpreted by people who knew nothing about us, and our images were subjected to startling dislocation. All of the interpretations of this fictional second have caused both amusement and much distress. Critics, journalists, and the art world bore down on our family. And then if we just see the next image, which was part of her presentation, so this image is Sally Mann as a child, and this image is taken by her parents. So this image for me, you know, kind of really made me think about her series because she said, I refused to wear any clothes until I was five years old and family photographs such as this prove it. Um, she said, I had an unconventional childhood, feral, unsupervised, dirty, boring, often lonely but this allowed me to become myself outside the margins. I wanted my kids to have the same freedom as I did, and so did my husband, to photograph them as natural, to photograph them was as natural as breathing for me. So yeah, and to summarize, you know, she just said that this love that carried her through, um, you know, her marriage and her family with her children um, will soon be gone, but um, what will remain are these pictures. But what will remain beyond that is the story of place and the narrative of place where they all grew up. Um, and I just wanted to mention that because obviously she is a huge inspiration to me. And just by seeing this image, um, I think was pivotal in kind of just summarising um, the way she took the photos of the immediate family series. I mean, it's 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 a fascinating case study, really. And I think it kind of prompts us all to think, um, as Alice touched on as well, that how, how important context is to everything that we do, to everything that we publish. Um, it's incredibly important to, um, you know, to, to couch something in the, in the sense in which it was intended um, so that it isn't taken out of context and kind of distorted in any way. Um, and I, I wanted to um, ask you in that case, how often, uh, Mandy, you immerse yourself in very long term projects. And I would like to kind of ask you to consider how that changes your opinions from the kind of beginning of a project to um, to how you evolve as you make your way through it. Yeah, I mean, I think. Initially, when you start a project, you can have preconceived ideas of what that project might be or what the outcome might be or what you think you might want to do. Um, but I don't think you can do that. You have to go in open minded. Um, for example, when I went to Henderson Island, I kind of knew what to expect in terms of I knew there was plastic on the shoreline and littering everywhere. But um, that's just a general kind of overview. And when I got there, I had to really, you know, find certain elements and things that engaged me. Um, and it's imperative that you work on work over a long period of time because it helps you uh, revisit initial things that you might have had ideas about in the beginning. I mean, I work in sketchbooks um, and I find it really helps to write down research ideas um, that can be about composition, about, you know, kind of latest discoveries. 
Uh, and I work through that. It's a kind of a process. And over time, I can flick back and maybe find something, you know, from the beginning that might link with something from the end. So time is something that allows you to really develop the narrative, um, you know, and it's something that just can't be done quickly. It's something that you have to fully immerse yourself in to fully understand the subjects and what you're dealing with. And, and I mean, what would you say, Alice, have you have you found making your work that there have been some interesting twists and turns that have led you in a slightly different direction? I wonder if we should just um, have another play of perhaps your perhaps you've got your the drummies work is is available for us to see while you talk about that. I, I realize I sort of touched on this a bit earlier, mm. um, but I, I do feel very much for me it has been important to kind of engage uh, in longer term projects. I think it's, you know, when working with people, it allows me time to get to know people, um, which I think, you know, it's very much for me, it's not just like visiting once and disappearing, it's like spending time as much as I'm able to with people and, you know, whether it's within a certain culture or like, revisiting the same people over and over I think that's a really um sort of important element for me and you know obviously builds trust but also allows me to kind of make sure that I am deeply engaging as much as I can and you sort of having a very nuanced view of kind of what I'm doing and understanding as much as possible the people that I'm working with, which, you know, is obviously very important. Um, and I think also, you know, the way that I work is I kind of go make some images, um, take some time away, go back. There's sort of a lot of time off in between, which I'm a very indecisive person and, I'm working on film, so I sort of always, you know, see the images immediately and then there's a lot of working through them once I have them, you know, it's contact sheets and then the scanning and, you know, so there, there's a lot that happens and I spend a lot of time with these images. And I think for me, that's really important. Um, I'm indecisive, but also impatient and I'm a perfectionist and I want everything to be amazing and to represent you know, to, to represent the, the kind of the perfect vision at the end, but, you know, that doesn't happen quickly and it, it can't happen quickly. And I think having that, you know, be, being forced to take time and go back and go back and go back and make sure that it kind of represents how the people who I work with see themselves and also is a kind of um, really, really considered view of what we're trying to do. I think that's really important. Um, and then also, sorry, <laughs> as an aside, I've always been really drawn to projects that have happened over a period of time. You know, it's a very simple thing of photography capturing a moment, but I, I love watching a transition happening or like, you know, how people evolve over time. Um, and I think, you know, with this project, um, seeing how a lot of the girls, uh, you know, grew so much more confident and empowered over the period of time that they were part of the drum majorettes teams. You know, it's very much about creating confidence for these young women and making them feel that they can do anything. Um, <laughs> you know, and like literally witnessing that, um, you know, like one of the girls, when I started the project, she was so shy, like her coach said that, you know, she, you know, like the, she, she couldn't really speak. She was like what, the most nervous girl on the team. And when I went back a few years later, she was like the most like outspoken. So kind of witnessing that change in people, I think is very interesting. Um, yeah, so I, I think, you know, that element of time is always very impactful. 
talking about young people, um, and again, that it would be lovely now to have another look at um, some of Mandy's work. Just while I ask you this question, Mandy, um, what would your advice be to anybody trying to sort of gain a foothold in this space that they feel may not be traditionally welcome to them? Um, yeah, I mean, research, 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 I'd probably say, first of all, in terms of, you know, what I think whatever subject matter you're dealing with, um, it's really important to know exactly what you're dealing with. And I'm trying to cover here inanimate objects and people, maybe, um, you know, if you can get people on board, if you know you're going to go into a situation where you're going to be, you're going to not feel confident Try and speak to people who could help you with that um, and build up your confidence a bit, or they could maybe be with you when you go into this particular environment. Um, I think you have to be prepared for it to be difficult. Um, you know, I've done many things where, you know, it has been difficult and I've, I've kind of gone in there knowing it is going to be. So I think as long as you're not kind of shocked and put off by that, you, you have to... I think sometimes work harder than maybe a man might have to um, in certain situations. So if you're prepared for that, you can, you know, kind of dress it um, mentally before you're actually in the physical space. Um, and I think just you have to sort of believe in yourself and believe in what you're doing. Um, I think if you find something really interesting that you want to tell a story about, um, there's a good chance that other people will want to hear that story as well. So if you can, you know, kind of build confidence in yourself and, you know, kind of stick with it and power on through, then hopefully the rewards will be there because it's your story. You know, everybody has a story to tell and, you know, it's really important that you're not put off and you don't give up, you know, for whatever reason it might be. And you can get your story out there, and, you know, told. I just uh, talking about, you know, your story, does, do you feel obviously plus the, the story of plastics and the and the problem of uh, plastics has become especially in um, marine plastics has been the sort of core business for you um over the over the last few years do you feel like there might be another story to tell albeit perhaps environmental that isn't about plastics have you got have you got something else that you uh, feel like you might like to tackle not for me no um, <laughs> I'm totally committed to the issue of plastic. Um, I'm sure the research coming out um, will, will far go beyond my lifetime. So I've got enough to kind of keep going with. Um, I am working on different ways of presenting the issue of plastic because if I just carried on doing the same soup style images, that's kind of boring for everyone and boring for, mostly for me. Um, so I try to do different approaches to different um, series of work to try and engage different audiences. And by doing that, it makes it more interesting for me. And again, probably makes me try harder to make a different type of um, representation work. So to try and keep it interesting for me, that's what I, I try and do. Um, and I'm always thinking of new ways to do that to enhance new research that's forever coming out. That's really interesting. I can't wait to see what what um, how you present it next. Um, and Alice, can I ask the same question to you? Do you have advice for anybody who might be trying to kind of break break through into a space they feel uh, not necessarily comfortable with? Um, I really liked what Mandy said about research. I think that's a very important point. Um, and I I'm I particularly someone who really likes references, and I think. If you want to do something understanding what other photographers have done before you kind of around that subject matter i think is really important and you know just as a source of inspiration and also you know as i was touching on earlier like understanding the context that you're entering into and the kind of discourse around that like what does it mean what have other people done and what is their stand i think that's like a really important thing is just like knowing the value of you know, as Mandy said, researching and knowing your references because, you know, other photographers work can be incredibly inspiring and often, you know, I have an idea and then able, like looking at what other people have done, it helps me articulate better what I want to do. Um, and I find that really helpful. I, I really enjoy kind of building up my reference library, I suppose. Um, and then I think also, something someone told me once is like and again touching on what Mandy said 
is like what matters to you and why and, and finding out why you want to do what you were doing I think is very important um then I think the last thing it's also a piece of advice I heard someone else giving once but I think it was very important um was you know like and I, I I'm mentioning this because I think it it applies to me very much is like is this what you want to do more than anything because I I, I do think it's it's not an easy industry. Um, there's a lot of challenges, a lot of self-doubt. Um, you know, people will be challenging you all the time. You'll be challenging yourself. Um, I think being so sure that like every, it is worth it and that, you know, what you have to say or well, the way that you're saying it makes sense to you and how will you translate that to other people? And like, is it so important that you are willing to kind of take on these challenges and like work through everything in order to do that I think is really important you know because I, I feel like sometimes people think maybe photography is like easy or glamorous and maybe it might look so but actually it's you know a lot of Mandy said like researching sitting mm. alone having it, it can be really solitary as well can't it I mean I think mm. that's something that <laughs> is not often recognized is how solitary the life of a photographer can be yeah, I, I think that's a really good point. You know, like I I love working with people. I think I'm I'm definitely a people person. And then the solitary aspect is something I really struggle with. So like kind of just taking uh taking account of these, the challenges that are there and like does it matter to you this much? I, I think is important. And yeah, it was advice I had someone else giving. And I was like, wow, that's a very articulate way to put it, you know. Like, are you willing to go through this? Um which I, I think, you know, makes sense. Yeah, I think it helps if you love what you do as well, doesn't it? <laughs> Especially if you have <laughs> to make quite an extreme effort to do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I wondered if um, if you might have questions for one another, actually. Um, mm. uh, Mandy, do you have quest uh, any questions that you'd like to ask Alice? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, her work is just amazing and looking at the the real there uh, just you know emotionally I can sort of feel those girls you know kind of their confidence sort of building even just by being photographed um yeah I was just thinking um if there are any other sort of subcultures that you would like to represent or are working on now that you um you know kind of want to highlight and let everybody know about um I think I mean there's always kind of like you know, there, there's always things that I'm interested in and I, I really, I really enjoy researching, you know, other people's work, but also further into like what I could go in. And I always have a number of kind of uh, avenues that I would like to focus on. Um, I think more particularly on these like subcultures, it is more about the larger representation of women and also how communities are represented, um, you know, and I know I've touched on this, but I think specifically, in South Africa, I think it's such a complex and nuanced space. And I think it's really, really important that myself and other photographers are able to work to create representations that kind of reflect this. Um, so I think very much for me, it's kind of like constantly thinking about how I can continue to address these ideas and, you know, not maybe uh, about specific subcultures, but kind of looking at groups and ideas and then how can we challenge stereotypes and create more like representative and um empathetic sort of depictions um that show people uh, yeah. sorry that was quite a loose <laughs> response but I, 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 hope it, I hope it makes sense you're not telling us really then are you <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I mean I, I think I never quite know like it, it as I said I it always takes me a really long time when I'm working on a project so I've started on one or two things but you know maybe in like five years I might have a more concise um concise sure answer. <laughs> yeah, well, I suppose because it, it's a it, process it, of it, evolution it, isn't it that's the thing any exactly. any project is a process of evolution yeah sorry I I I, I was and trying to be evasive there. That's <laughs> so very much I, I also wanted to ask you um, what your subjects um, feel and think when they see them uh, when they see themselves in in photographs and publications. I mean, because you're empowering them just by the act of photographing them, um, and I just wonder what they think when they see the final images and see themselves, you know, 
um, looking like that. They must be, you know, anyway, you tell me how they feel. <laughs> um, I, I think this is a really important question. Um, and again, it touches on that sort of responsibility thing I was talking about. A uh, really important part for me whenever I make images to somebody is I always make a print for them. If I go back once, they get, you know, one or two pictures. If I go back a few times, um, you know, and, you know, when I was working with the drum majorettes, they were looking through the camera with me and directing each other. So seeing how it would look through the lens and, you know, watching each other kind of uh, create the compositions um, and then each time I'd go back I'd always bring the prints back and I, I feel like in this digital age especially with younger generations you know and, and I think for all of us we're so used to just seeing everything on a screen so for me you know the one way to have it is like make things feel special it's working on film and then also to bring prints like physical prints that like people can have um, so it's been really cool when revisiting people that I've worked with, see those pictures in their houses. Yeah, I really um, like that. That's I, like, nice. <laughs> I went to someone recently and he had put it into the family photo album with like documentation and like very old newspaper articles. And so for me to be able to like contribute in a very small way to you know, these archives that people have, you know, people are giving me their time and, you know, giving me their trust. And for me to be able to give them something back um, is really important. And I think, you know, where I have been able to, I always try and share the way that the images have been shared, you know, like if I can visit back, like we'll try and get a copy of a magazine or that sort of thing. Um, Cause I think it's important also, like it's honoring, you know, the trust that people have given me and showing them like you know being able to to share in that with them is quite important absolutely and i like the idea of the collaboration where they're looking through the lens and looking at what you're actually photographing you know that might in, empower them to become photographers you know that's kind of a nice i mean i always love that idea of like one person you know like one of the the younger people i work with that like, was inspired then i feel happy you know That'd be amazing hand the gift yeah. on yeah it's like and, sharing um, that also you know it's like very much it's, it's a conversation it's a way of sharing and collaboration and you know as you said Fiona, like when you you know it's, it's solitary being a photographer sometimes mm -hmm. so being able to like have that interaction and kind of like share that i think that is so important and you know yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and um, Alice, do you have a, a question from Mandy? And also just, I know we've got a, a little sort of technical help in the background. It would just be so nice to see some more of Mandy's pictures, if, if possible, um, while you're asking your question. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so Mandy's very beautiful book, uh, Beyond Drifting, Imperfectly Known Animals. I think this is a gorgeous book. Um, it references the form of a 19th century scientific album. And Mandy, I really like the way that your images are in dialogue with that sort of older format of presenting work. And I wanna know where the inspiration for presenting the project in this way came from for you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the whole basis behind the project is to highlight the fact that plankton were eating microplastics in the marine environment. And I came across um, um, a marine biologist in the 1800s called John Vaughan Thompson, and he was collecting pioneering discoveries of plankton um, sort of 200 years ago when there was no plastic in the ocean. Um, and I looked at his memoirs and his um, scientific slides of plankton in the 1800s, and I thought it would be a really cool idea to kind of make plastic plankton from the plastic in the same places where he collected um, the original plankton. So that 200 years difference um, sort of was the sort of stem, stem the project really to present the work as this old antique battered science book. Uh, I wanted people to look like they were picking up a book from you know 200 years ago and then opening it and thinking they were looking at plankton that had been discovered then. But actually, it was a kind of a trick, and they're actually looking at pieces of plastic that had been made to look like plankton. Um, so yeah, the whole thing was, you know, this uh, past and present um, problem. I mean, I thought it was such a like 
original and very aesthetically effective way of kind of presenting your work and then also you know tying it into that history of you know um the documentation like that kind of scientific model i i i, I you know i haven't seen the book in person i i hope to one day but i just thought that was a really beautiful and very effective way of i think there might be an image from it coming up shortly on this yeah <laughs> no i i i mean i'm sure we we all love photo books, but I, I, this is a beautiful example of like how a photo book should be done. Um, in my opinion. it was, it was actually a labour of love because uh, myself and the publisher overlaps. We actually sanded personally all the corners of the book because oh it was, we, I just yeah. wanted the book to feel like it was an old handled book from years ago. So yeah, it was um, a labour of love. <laughs> no, I mean it. It looks it looks really really amazing. Um, I, I hope to see it in person at some point. Oh, this is um, this is one, isn't it? This is one of the images of the book. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I like the way, yeah. You know, sorry. Um, I'm, I'm getting excited. <laughs> no, I, I, I just said, I, I think channeling those kind of modes of picturing that we used, I think the way that you've kind of done that is so effective really be very beautiful as well they're so beautiful and now we're just we've only got 10 minutes of our chat left so I know that we've got a couple of um, questions from the audience so I'm just gonna click on those and see if I can okay so uh, there's a question from Angelica and she has asked how you scan the images um uh, maybe uh, Alice well you probably both work in film actually um so what how do you go about scanning your images uh Mandy do you want to go first um yes I mean the beyond drifting series that you've just seen there of the um specimens they were actually taken on film so those are scans from film um for that particular project um and I have I had a flatbed scanner um in my studio that I used to to scan those because I wanted them to look like old plankton samples. So I wasn't too concerned with the precise detail and sharpness of the scans. I mean, they're pretty good scans, good quality, but I didn't need the level of scanning that perhaps Alice would for her images. Mine was a kind of, you know, um, antique feel. So um, that was perfect for what I needed. I mean, I actually also use generally a flatbed scanner, which I think just because previously I've, I'm scanning so many images, um, you know, often I, I take, I make a lot of images. Um, I might only use a few, but I'm, I'm giving prints back to everybody. So there's like a huge volume that I'm scanning. It's probably not a very effective way of working, but um, so I, I, I'm using a flatbed that I do myself and my assistant helps me. But regarding your question about kind of quality I when I when I have to make larger prints I do end up having to rescan them um because I you know it, it, when you're working with one of the emicons as opposed to a flatbed I think especially when you're wanting to get the detail in somebody's face um I think that's really important to have a high quality scan but I I don't also generally mind sometimes a slightly softer quality I think it can be quite nice um you know, obviously depending. So so the other question um, is um, from Angelica also. She says that she photographs youth um, quite a lot and she often finds that their relationship with the photograph is it can be can be a bit mixed, perhaps a bit conflicted. Um, so she's saying that sometimes what she sees as beautiful, the subject perhaps doesn't. So how do you, you know, um, how do you deal with that? Um, Alice, perhaps perhaps the question's more directed at you as, as your work is mainly portraiture. I think very much it's kind of uh, trying as much as possible to align with the people that you're working with. I don't want to represent people in a way that they don't feel confident about. So it's very much also making clear before, this is what I have done, this is how my previous images look, so I think people need to have an idea, which is really important. Um, and then, you know, actually the making of the image is not like a quick thing, but it's, it's a conversation, you know, 
what I often do, especially when I'm working on film, is I take pictures even on my cell phone and I show like the framing and I'm like, this is what the image will look like. And, you know, people then can like readjust themselves or, you know, so I, I find that quite helpful just using the cell phone or otherwise they use a digital camera and I just present to people before, like, this is what I'm thinking of how it should look. And, you know, it's also then, as I said before, like framing what I'm doing, explaining, people then know what's happening and they can project that. But then once we have that, then kind of showing the, the, the reference, um, which I, I find is a very helpful way of kind of perhaps addressing that concern. So, so really it is just about uh, opening up that conversation for collaboration so that really what you finally end up with is something that you're both happy with. A back and forth. A so it, it, it could be a compromise in a way. Mm -hmm. It's like the, the best thing. And I'm like, I'm a people pleaser. So, you know, it's coming from that. But when I can go back and give someone the image and they're like, oh, yeah, this is what I wanted. You know, I think that's for me where I want to be, where, where people feel feel happy about it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of where where I, I try to come from in the in the conversation. And Mandy, would you find that, you know, often when you're bridging the gap between art and science, as you do, are you reaching compromises from time to time as well? Um, <clears throat> I try not to. Um, the, the main thing for me is that I represent the research correctly that the scientists have uh, um, entrusted me with. Um, that's the main thing. You know, I can't exaggerate anything or... Um, not be true to the facts. So um, whilst I work subjectively, um, scientists aren't subjective um, at all. So they're very factual based. So I have to make sure that we kind of meet in the middle somehow. I think we both have, both have the same objective, but we're working in different ways. So, um, you know, we have to sort of meet in the middle and um, usually, no, I don't think I compromise on on the you know the facts I can't compromise on the facts um so but that's on so the composition I, I have a bit of leeway yeah well it's been really absolutely fascinating talking to you both this evening so thank you so much for giving up your time and um sharing your insights as very powerful women in photography <laughs> thank you so much well we haven't got any more questions from the audience so um perhaps it's time for a well-earned cup of tea <laughs> <laughs> well, thank, thank you for you having so me much. thank yeah, it's you it's been really nice to chat with you mandy and thank you for fiona for managing the conversation in such an artful way and you yeah likewise <laughs> <laughs> lovely cool. to see you both thank you have a good evening thank and you. you thank you bye bye, bye.